Welcome everyone to tonight's seller series. I am Diane Needle and we have, I know it, it's not Bruce tonight. We, we, we marketed this that, that my partner Bruce Needle would be on tonight. Um, but the damn weather happened and the sun came out. And so Bruce's playoff softball game, which is like, you know, that's just, you know, the biggest thing ever when you are at his age. Um, he had to go play his softball playoff game tonight. So he's not here, but that's okay because these two rock stars are here and I want to introduce them. So Justin Mandisi, Justin is a dear friend of mine and a real estate agent in Rhode Island. Um, he has our relationship. Um, we have, I have referred Justin business. I have clients here in Massachusetts and Sharon who have condo, who have had condos to sell in Rhode Island, who have um, had who have moved to Rhode Island, moved to Mass, etc. Um, so we've been giving referrals back and forth to each other for some years now. Um, and I trust Justin implicitly. And I think one big part of this business that we have is knowing real, at least our business, and I know the people that are on here now have relationships with great realtors. We actually know them, we like them, we trust them, and having them to send our clients to um, is just such a great resource. So welcome, Justin. Hey, you forgot to mention that I'm a younger, cuter version of Bruce. That's, oh, that's why and, you keep... And, and he's a younger, cuter version of Bruce. Yes. yes. Okay. Sorry. I did miss that. Sorry. Sarah, I missed that. How could I have missed that? I don't know. And Bruce, and Bruce looks really good in pink, too, by the way, just for the record. Just for the record. All right. Now I want to introduce Sarah Tufano. Sarah is a rock star realtor in Connecticut. Um, and again, same kind of thing. Clients that are moving to Connecticut, relocating to Boston or Rhode Island. Um, we have had a relationship for a while. And um, now we're actually all part of the same brokerage. I think we've all been in different places over our careers, including Sarah, you were with Caldwell Banker for a while. Um, Justin, you were with Hill Harbor for a while, which is a, was a big place in Rhode Island. Um, Keller Williams for me. Now we're all part of Real Broker. And uh, we mastermind together, and it's a great it's a great place to be. So, uh, welcome everyone, and good luck, Bruce Needle. I don't know who said that. <laughs> oh, hey, Jana, thanks for joining us tonight. Um, so, I am learning how to use Streamyard, so I'm still a little bit um, challenged, but we'll we'll keep moving on. So tonight, what Bruce and I were going to dish about were some seller disasters, right? So um, we can't talk about our own clients because that wouldn't be right. <laughs> but what we can talk about is how we can make sellers and future sellers more successful um, when they need to sell their property by kind of sharing stories of what has happened when um, buyer agents take their buyers to the walkthrough of the seller's house and what that entails and what makes a really good walkthrough, as we call it, versus what could end up being a disaster, right? Um, and I want to, um, we'll get into this in a little bit, but um, Bruce on our team um, works mainly as a buyer agent and I work mainly as a listing agent. Um, so, um, and I know Justin and Sarah, Sarah, you're a rock star. Both of you do listings and represent buyers. Mm -hmm. So we've both been on both sides of it all the time. Um, and knowing that our audience, we're talking to sellers mostly. Um, let's go into some of those stories. So um, I'm sure you guys have a few. Um, I told Justin, oh, by the way, what is everyone drinking tonight? We thought we would come with like a little cocktail. It is seven o'clock and it is Thursday. <gasps> Look at you. Summer. Some red wine. Oh, oh! I feel like we should all cheers. We should all just, you know, <laughs> cheers. cheers. <laughs> I just discovered White Claw. I know I'm a little late to the game. You're late I to the party, girl. In a, a charity golf tournament we had the other day, I discovered. Um, oh, Thirsty Thursday. <laughs> high noons. High noons. She's Kaylin's right. The new ones are high noons. That's 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 okay. the new kid on the block. Sarah, I had a high noon watermelon. Delicious. During, so during the golf tournament. And I'm telling you, number one, it was delicious. 
but I am a lightweight. Talk about a cheap date. Like one of those, forget ah. about it. I don't know what it is. Is it like really high in alcohol or something? But vodka soda, ooh. right? Vodka soda, I think it is. That's it, that's it. It's delicious. It was so delicious. Like, I mean, you know, I used to say I'm never, I'm not one of those women. I come home like after a hard day and have a glass of wine. I was never one of those women, but I think I could be one of those women that has a high noon every day. When I <laughs> they should pay us for the free advertisement. Right? Yeah. Um, so yeah. So anyways. All right. So talk about, let's talk about a walkthrough. Have either of you guys had any recent walkthrough experiences as a buyer agent that didn't go as well as you hoped? Anything come into mind? Oh, Justin, go for us. it. Nodding your head there, buddy. <laughs> well, it's not only, um, so it's it goes both ways. When you're a buyer's agent and we're doing a walkthrough, you're really hoping that everything's going to be in good shape and, and, and that the seller took care of what they were supposed to, but sometimes they don't. But I'll be honest with you, it's worse when you're the seller's agent. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Justin, you're freezing on us. Oh, no. Right? Ah. What could go wrong? What could happen? Right. What are the things that could possibly happen? So... I know um, one of the more recent issues for me was we, I had a, a walkthrough and um, we were supposed to leave a whole bunch of furniture behind. When we get to the final walkthrough, nothing there, nothing. Everything was contractually obligated to be left behind. The sellers understood and they just <gasps> took it. <laughs> oh my God. So what oh my it, God. obviously that creates <laughs> mass hysteria. Obviously, that creates mass hysteria right at the very end, which is the last thing you want to do because that's when all the tensions are the greatest. So 100%. I was really, you know, yeah, taken aback, and it ends up being a negotiation at the closing table about what's what, who was supposed to have who, how much does this cost, yada yada yada. So definitely, I can say one one seller tip, which may seem obvious, if you're contractually obligated to leave some stuff behind, leave it behind. Yeah. Yeah. And I, actually would you, I, I would, I would chime in too and say, you know, most times you're going to pay more at the last minute for a credit or whatever it is that needs to be agreed upon at the last hour. Like they're going to ask for more than it would cost you just to leave it or oh, do what you were yeah. supposed to do. The perfect example of that, Sarah, is the, is the washer and dryer. Always. I don't know why laundry is always an issue. Now your washer and dryer is probably the seller's washer and dryer is probably old, right? But God forbid they take it because they forgot they were supposed to leave it. Don't think that the buyer agent isn't going to say, "Well, you know, they might have been ten years old, but now to replace it, <laughs> it's a thousand dollars for a washer. It's five hundred for a dryer. We need fifteen hundred dollars, right?" Yeah. Well, so absolutely, and I would say as a listing agent. I think it's very important that we remind our sellers of these things because sometimes it's just really innocent, right? Mm -hmm. I had a situation, this one was funny. I, You would have thought it might've been a bonus to the buyers, uh, but I had a seller leave a trampoline in the backyard. And they simply, you know what? They were moving out of state. They were moving down to Miami and they just forgot, right? They just forgot that the trampoline was something they had to remove. And let me tell you, it was really big. And it was a very, it was a really good quality trampoline. So much so that what do you think I did? Threw it on Facebook market. No, it's in my yard now. <laughs> no joke. The trampoline is in my yard. But I had to hire somebody that morning after the walkthrough Thankfully, you know, as a listing agent, we know a lot of people, right? That's mm -hmm. key. We know who to call when we need, when we have a problem. And I called my, I call him my schlepper. <laughs> like, can you get over here? I've got a trampoline and they got rid of it. But, you know, it was, it costs like $250 to remove it. Mm -hmm. um, and then we were able to close, but that's, uh, yeah, those are the kinds of problems that happened last minute. And like I said, a lot of times it's innocent. So reminding the sellers and as a listing agent, maybe even doing a walkthrough before the walkthrough is a good idea. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, did we lose Justin? I don't know what happened. To yeah, I don't know. He might be yeah. moving because his internet is usually not so great outside. It's a little spotty. Yeah. maybe. Um, but yeah, no, to your point, I mean, doing a walkthrough before the walkthrough could be a good option. I actually have a checklist that I send out a week before closing and I tell them, make sure you don't leave paint behind. Don't leave any 
furniture behind that you don't want. Um, this actually just happened. I, I sent the checklist. I even uh, notated a couple of things that the buyer and him had agreed to leave. And what I tell you, I knew he was moving. Yeah, we knew you were moving to get better internet. Nice job. Um, yeah. Yeah. And so then the buyer goes to do their walkthrough. I have the seller and we had gone through this multiple times. Hey, you have to leave this. You make sure everything's out. All your personal property is gone. Don't leave paint cans. Don't leave any building materials. The buyer doesn't want them. And the buyer goes to do their walkthrough. They left a desk. They left a, you know, like a rickety old chair. They left silverware, like all different things. And he said, well, you know, why are they so mad? It's just a few things. And I said, well, we went over this. You weren't supposed to leave all these items. We gave you a checklist. You said everything was gone and it cost him $500. Yep. Totally. And so I, it, love, I love the paint can one. Okay. Yeah. Because it costs money to get rid of them. How many times have we gone to walkthroughs and mm -hmm. the listing agent will say to you, Oh, the sellers left you the paint. And nobody wants your paint, old paint. And it's like 30 cans of paint from like, you know, 20 paint jobs ago. Yeah. Right. Like, come on, come on folks. Right. We have to educate our sellers. Don't leave the old paint cans. And if unless you ask, I've had people say, well, let's ask the buyer. And if they say, yeah, that's fine. Leave it. If they say no, then make sure you get rid of it. Totally. Totally. Um, Bruce recently, um, this was a great one just recently. Um, yesterday, and I mean really recently, we had a walkthrough and I went to the walkthrough with his buyer. He wasn't available and the house is empty and it was beautiful, nice and clean, shiny hardwood floors. Everything was out. Buyer was super excited. And I think I was walking around the outside of the house and I'm like, oh, did you go to the basement? He's like, yeah, there's a, there's a little issue I never noticed before. There's like an inch of water in the center of the basement in like, a, you know, it was kind of like probably like a six foot by six foot circle in this big unfinished basement, but there was a huge puddle of water. And um, we ended up going, to, it was never there before. Um, we're like, did a water heater break? Like what happened? It was very odd. It wasn't near in the furnace. It wasn't near the water heater. You could tell it was definitely the lowest part of the basement, right? And so we went to closing. Thankfully, the listing agent was very reasonable. And we did, a, I think we did like a $2,000 holdback in order for us to get a plumber in there out because everyone had to close. The sellers were buying another house that day, mm -hmm. right? The buyers wanted to start school with their kids. Everyone really wanted to close. So we did what's known as a holdback. And for people that don't know, it just simply means that the seller, you as a seller, you don't get all your proceeds. You're going to leave some money back and not get it until the problem is resolved. Um, and it's it has to be enough skin in the game that you're not gonna be like, oh, screw it. I, I won't throw out the trash. I don't need that money, right? So $2,000 is a, is a substantial amount of money. And um, and it, it closed, uh, but here's what we found out. The sellers had not been on the property for two weeks. So they didn't know. They had no idea that was there, right? So again, if you're a seller and you have vacated the property, right, have somebody go check it before the walkthrough so that there isn't this surprise. Because now you're at the closing table. Everyone wants everything to happen. There's moving trucks full of stuff. Everyone is waiting for their money, waiting to move in. And everything is stalled and the attorneys have to get involved. Speaking of which, in Massachusetts, we have attorneys Justin, Sarah, talk to me about Rhode Island and Connecticut. Are you are you attorney states, um, either of you, Justin? So Rhode Island is not an attorney state. Um, we do things differently than Massachusetts a few different ways. Number one, in Massachusetts, you make a binding offer uh, agreement first before you move to a purchase and sales agreement. Right. Okay. So essentially you make an offer with all the terms laid out that would be on a purchase and sales agreement. The buyer and seller you know, negotiate and sign off on that offer. And then you have the inspection period, typically. Um, okay. And then after that, you move to purchase and sales agreement, which is drafted most often by attorneys. Here in Rhode Island, it's the opposite. You actually go straight to purchase and sales with an so inspection. One step state I refer that to, one right? Step state, right. 
with a, um, an inspection contingency built in, but attorneys don't get involved until after that whole process has been taken care of. And all they do, uh, whether it's an attorney or a closing agent, you do not need to be an attorney in Rhode Island. That was a big deal recently. Um, one of the top closing agents was um, brought, brought up to court, but won in court um, to say that he could still be a closing agent because according to the law in Rhode Island, you do not have to be an attorney. Um, and he, so he continues to practice. He's phenomenal, by the way, Dan Bulkin. Um, but, yeah. <laughs> um, but also you, um, so the attorneys don't get involved here. So I can tell you having done deals in both Massachusetts and Rhode Island, yeah. Rhode Island is a lot simpler process than what it is like in Massachusetts where the attorneys get involved for sure. I think we have a strong uh, l lawyer lobby, right? <laughs> What you got Harvard there, so I guess uh, you know. <laughs> yeah, we've, got to keep, we've got to keep the lawyers employed here in Massachusetts, so right. yeah, let's we'll not keep it easy. Although right. I have to say, we love our attorneys, and um, I worked for attorneys for 25 years, and um, you know that's that's something I think I talked about on one of the other shows, and um, I, I want to bring it up again, which is when deals are going smoothly, it's really easy to be good at what you do, right? It's like, you know, I always say like, in the face of adversity, you better have someone good on your side, right? And how, right, to make things happen. So what do I mean by that? When there's water in the basement, and you go to closing, and let's just say the agent is not as accommodating, right? And is a jerk or whatever. Um, Bruce was actually telling me a story tonight because I was mad at him that he couldn't be here. So I'm like, give me your stories. I need to, I need your stories. So he told me a story. There was, um, he had sellers that were getting divorced and they, they were fighting over the washer and dryer. And one of them took them and they were supposed to leave them, right? And then at the closing table, it was the attorneys that had to get involved and resolve it. Right. And to the point where the buyer's attorney had his clients walk up and walk out. We're done. We're done. We're not closing. And finally, what happened? The sellers were like, OK, you know, uncle, you know, let's let's give them what they need, because why are we going to kill this deal over at probably one or two thousand um, dollars? But you need an attorney at that point that knows what they're doing. Right. Or else like the whole thing. It's like, you know, that was a big deal to the buyers. There should have been the washer and dryer there. And another attorney might have rolled over and been like, oh, well, let's just let it go. It's fine. Let's just close. Right. You really need an advocate who's good at negotiation and also can keep the deal together, even if it is to walk up and walk away. Right. No, of course. And, and uh, obviously we as agents who are in the game every single day doing lots of deals, we know when these problems are going to be you know, headed when they need to be headed off and we know how to solve them too. So a lot of the times I'm sure you guys, as well as, as, as I can kind of get these things solved before it even gets to that level, you know, it's common sense usually does prevail. So you just need to, you know, make sure that, that, that we, you get to that point. But, you know, Diane, there's one other thing, um, by the way, shout out to Tim Macy, who we're all, uh, the godfather of, yeah. of real Tim Macy. In <laughs> yeah. the house. Well, you know, he's in another state. I mean, talk about, is that like the wild, wild west where he is? He should come on and well, tell us. Yeah. <laughs> um, Tim, Tim but, says, how do you go about picking a good attorney? Hey, look at you giving the softballs. Thanks, buddy. Appreciate <laughs> <Yeah>. that. <laughs> Listen, right. it here's how not to pick an attorney. It's not your brother's sister's cousin's wife who practices personal injury law. That is how not to pick an attorney. Okay. How many times do we say, oh, it's easy. Um, you know, my sister, well, I, yeah, she knows real estate. I think she does like divorce law and, um, yeah, like domestic abuse cases, but yeah, she's going to be my real estate attorney. <laughs> like really, you know, I, I know. Well, how well, and I always, I do like to explain to people too, that there's, there's a benefit to using the people that I already have a relationship with, because when shit hits the fan, 
I have mm -hmm. access to that person on a Saturday night or a Sunday afternoon totally. when your other, you know, whatever divorce attorney is not going to answer the phone until Monday. Monday's a holiday. I can reach any of my attorneys on a holiday. Yep. It's a hotline, right? It's like mm -hmm. you've got them on text, you've got them on cell. Um, yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. And hey, really hey, great by points, the way, Sarah. Diane, by the way, the same law applies on how to pick a realtor. You don't pick your sister's boyfriend's cousin's third roommate. That's right. Hello. <laughs> Hello. That's Hello. You pick somebody that knows what they're doing, that has the experience, that sees all these things, that can explain it all to you so that you know exactly what's going to happen throughout the whole process. I, if I could interject a story into, into this scenario here. Please do. I, I'm segueing <laughs> a little bit, but... Segwaying into the third part of tonight's program, um, I have seen real estate agents cost their clients tens of thousands of dollars that I can actually quantifiably point to. Let oh. me give you an example. Okay. Let me give you an example. I was representing a buyer a few years ago, went to the house, tons of showings first day on the market. Now this was in a down market. So it just goes to show you there was a lot of activity on this house, right? Yeah. Um, I was the last showing of the night and I stepped, uh, stepped in the door, agent gave me the rundown, said I have one offer on the table, but go through and then let me know after what you think. I said, great. Ran through with my client. My client and I had been searching for a while. He knew exactly what he wanted. That was the house he wanted. We wrote an offer that night. Oh, on the way out, I mentioned to the agent, I said, we're very interested. I will be in touch. Now, this was about almost nine o'clock at night that I walked out the door. Okay. I go home, write an offer for $10,000 over asking price, which again, five or six years ago, wasn't happening. $10,000 over asking price. I get the offer signed by around 10, 1030 that night, send it off to the agent. And I wait until the morning out of respect to follow up with a phone call. 8.30 the next morning, I call the agent. Good morning, just wanted to make sure you got my offer last night. Uh, no, I didn't see it. Well, look in your email. Uh, I don't know, look in your spam. <laughs> oh, here it is, I found it, great. Hopefully this is acceptable to the sellers, it's $10,000 over asking price, I'm sure they're gonna be you know, enamored with that. Oh, well, it's too late. He already accepted another offer. What? Yeah, last night, as soon as you left, the seller came home. I presented the other offer to him and he took it. Now I said, whoa, whoa time out. Time out. I told you on the way out that I was writing an offer. You didn't even text me, call me, email me, nothing, saying you were, you were going to present it that very moment to that seller without me. I wasn't even home yet to write an offer. I said, do me a favor, take a picture of your seller's face when you show him my offer that's $10,000 over the price that you probably just had him accept. Which he is legally obligated to present, am I right? Yes. Legally obligated to present. Yeah. He went silent. Yeah. He went absolutely yep. silent because he knew I was going to hold him to showing his seller that offer. So I can't imagine the hell that he caught the next day. But yep. that's the incompetence that happens when you – work with somebody that's your sister's cousin's brother's, you know, third roommate that doesn't know what the hell they're doing. So I, I, I can't agree with you more. It's awful. It's awful. And, and oh, by the way, there's no way to come out of that. And that's the problem. And that's, that's one of the challenges with this business. You know, we always say, well, I always say who you work with matters, right? But you only have one house to sell. It's not like, you know, you're buying toothpaste and if you overpay at CVS, you go buy it at Target the next week. It's your biggest asset. You've got one shot at it. And if you hire that person, that person, what's he going to do now? It's over. It's done. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, $10,000, right? Exactly. Gone. There's $10, no $10,000. None. None. There's and no that's, only one, that's only one example. I mean, there's tons of examples. I mean, so we, many. I mean we've all seen agents screw up. As, things as small as typos costing people tens of thousands of dollars. Typos, mm -hmm. totally. right? Those I have, are the I have so many stories like that, Justin. Actually, I'm gonna chime in. I'm gonna chime in there because I had one, I had a listing, this was last year, right before the pandemic. I listed a um, half duplex in Stratford and this agent came in with an offer. 
I had multiples. So I think I requested highest and best by a certain day. Um, anyways, he came in with an offer that I think was like 10,000 or 20, 20,000 over list. Great. Um, we accept the offer and he goes three days later, three days later, after it's fully executed, he comes back to me and said, Oh, Sarah, I made a mistake. It was a typo in the numbers. It was supposed to be 10,000 over, not 20. And I said, I don't know what to tell you. That's not my fault. If you put, if it was 10,000 over, I would have chosen another offer. So I don't know what to tell you. And it, it turned out they ended up just paying the extra money, but I can't imagine how those buyers were when they realized that they then had to pay $20,000 more than they were planning to. Unbelievable. Let's talk a little bit about how appraisal gaps have um, recently, at least in my market, have made my sellers a boatload of money um, because that appraisal gap has protected them mm -hmm. in situations where the house is not appraising. Um, it's a tough place to be. And listen, as buyer agents, as well as selling agents, you know, I don't know about you guys, but a more balanced market definitely feels a lot better. I think as a real estate agent, everyone's like, oh, everything's selling so fast. It's great to be you. You know, that's not it's true. Not, it's, it's not almost, great. You need more skill in a market like this, right? You need to know how to how to manage multiple offers and you need to know how to address the things that come up. For example, we just closed on a deal where I had multiple offers. The house was priced in the mid sevens. I had an offer that was close to nine. And I had all the comps and I knew that house was not going to appraise. So who was the best buyer? And we were in a multiple offer situation. The best buyer was the buyer who could bridge the gap between what I thought it would appraise for and what they were offering, right? Because at the end of the day, if you don't address that when an offer comes in, then you're subject to renegotiation, right? Because the bank is only going to lend money to a buyer for what that asset is worth according to the appraiser. So if, it, if they say it's only worth 830 and they're paying 890, that's a $60,000 difference. So what's going to happen? They have to cover that difference somehow. And that was a situation where the sellers are going, whoa, what a great offer, what a great offer. But if that buyer only has 20% to put down or 10% to put down and not enough bandwidth to cover a gap like that, you're shit out of luck. Your, 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 your 890 offer is really toilet paper, right? It will never, it will never um, come to fruition, as they say. So um, in that particular case, that was the situation the house appraised for $45,000 less than the buyers were paying. And yes. guess what? They paid it. They came up with it. They mm -hmm. came up with it because I put it in the contract. It was part of the offer and it went through and it closed and my sellers. We'll see. And that's where I think too. I mean, you know, uh, you know, Tammy Price is chiming in. Not all agents are created equally and that's true. Do your research. But if you're, I also feel like in a market like this, you have a lot of, people who say, well, I'm just going to go get my real estate license. It looks so easy and I'll make a lot of money. Well, it's not that simple. It's not all rainbows and butterflies, but you also have to have the knowledge and the expertise to guide your clients. So I had a seller recently, we had an offer, I think it was like 60 over ask. And then I had some that were a little bit more reasonable. And I, I said to her, I said, these people are offering this much because they're hoping that you'll take their offer and then they're banking on a low appraisal so that you'll have to come down anyway. Right. And she was like, you know what? That makes a lot of sense. I said, why don't you take the offer that's the strongest, that has the most amount of money down because these people don't have the money extra to come you know, with the appraisal gap. And the agent told me that straight out. So I said, well, it doesn't make sense to take this offer. We know for a fact it's not going to appraise. Like, here's the comps. Here's everything that's sold. She's like, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. We took a lower offer and it appraised right on the money. And it was no problem. We got it done. But again, it's 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 uh, an attractive number to your seller, but having to articulate why it's not in their best interest to take that offer, I think, goes a long way. 
So what we're talking about right now, I mean, Justin, you know the stats on real estate, people that get their license, you know, everyone sees this hot market, they're running out, they're getting licensed, they want to be a real estate agent and sell houses. What we're talking about here, the 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 breadth of experience in this in this chat right now is like and the and the and the mistakes and the the level of experience and the tools that we have in our toolbox right now to help our clients. You don't get that when you pay three hundred dollars and get your real estate license. <laughs> you know, you don't get that when you're your sister's brother's cousin's roommate, right? Um, so it's just so important. I agree. You have to do your research. What Tammy said is true. Do your research, read the reviews, get a referral, talk to, talk to friends of yours that have sold, who have they used? Um, and, and listen, some experiences may not be good, right? And you know, what, what you see isn't always necessarily what you get as well. Right. Um, and so it's just really, really important for people to do their research. They don't get a do over. You don't get a do over, you know, how about price adjustments? You know, one of the uh, past episodes, we talked about staging and how important presentation is, right? And a story with that is the cost of staging is going to be a lot less money than the cost of a price reduction, right? Exactly. Exactly. You know, and, and oftentimes that is something that sellers overlook is, you know, there's going to be a cost to... Look, there's, there's three reasons why a home sells or doesn't sell, right? It boils down to this price presentation and the marketing, right? So if the price is right and the presentation's right, the marketing is, is going to be, it's going to be relatively easier, right? If the price is wrong and your marketing is wrong, the marketing is going to be tough because I don't care how much you market a rough looking dog. It's going to be a rough looking dog, right? So that's what it's going to be. But if you can work together in kind of a synchronous you know, fashion and be a team with your agent or, or whoever you choose to work with, it will create a much better harmonious you know, situation where people, it's gonna work. You're gonna, people are gonna see value in your home. Um, but th what Diane said is 100% true. The price of a, of a price reduction could be significantly more than making the home present the right way the first time around. Well, and I think a price reduction, just to add on to that, I mean, it just tells people, A, they walk in the door saying, what's wrong with it? And then they say, if nobody else wanted it, do I really want it? And if I want it, do I really want to pay that price? Uh, you know, they, they come in the door immediately looking for problems. And that that's one of the things, I mean, I see it with my own buyers. You know, they, they'll text me and say, hey, I saw such and such came back on the market three times. You know, why why did it come back on the market or why did they reduce their price? And nothing other than it wasn't priced correctly initially. And B, who knows why it came back on the market? It could be inspection items. It could be financing. It could be a whole lot of things, but that's irrelevant. But they don't see it that way. They go in immediately looking for problems. They assume it was inspection items and they go in looking for the issues and ultimately results in a lower offer. So as a buyer agent, what would be your top three pieces or, or let's just each give one piece of advice to a seller before the walkthrough what do you want to tell the seller what do what do you when you walk into a listing with your buyer that on the day of closing and you're going to do the walkthrough what's going through your head that you hope you don't find <laughs> And what is it that you find that you go, oh my gosh, this is awesome? Yeah, here's one. Ready? What I hope I don't find, what I hope I don't find is when the um, wall-mounted TV has been ripped off the wall and they took the mount with them and left holes in the wall. I love that. <laughs> I hate when that. Oh, happens. I hate That's that. Awesome. No, I hate that. <laughs> totally uh, hate that. Yes, if you're a seller, my best advice for you is leave the damn mount on the wall. It costs 20 bucks. Go buy a new one and don't worry about it. Just leave the damn thing on the wall. Hallelujah! Hallelujah! That's it. That's it. Um, no, that that is one specific thing that I, I often hope to never run into. Um, other than that, though, really, listen. It says, I, I don't remember in Massachusetts, but I know in Rhode Island, it says 
specifically, yes, broom swept. Broom clean. So yeah. make sure it is clean. I'm not asking you to hire someone to scrub every corner of every room to make sure it's clean enough for them to move in and, and take showers right away. And and I appreciate it when sellers do do that. But honestly, it it needs to be clean. It needs to be broom swept. It needs to not look like you just moved out and left everything else behind. Don't take the scraps, take the crap off the floor, take the, you know, sweep, uh, uh, you know, get the kitchen clean. Make sure it looks good enough such that it can be an acceptable position for them to move in and then, you know, get ready to live their lives there. I, I always remind my sellers, you're buyers. You, you're going to be a buyer someday, right? If you were the person buying this house, how would you like to find it? You know, this is where a buyer, they're paying good money for your house. They're walking in. How would you like a, a house to be left? That's how you should leave a house for the buyer, right? Just it's good karma all the way around, right? That whole do unto others thing. It's so true, mm -hmm. right? And I will sometimes tell my sellers, get it professionally cleaned. Why not? I mean, if you don't, the buyers will. And you know what? It just causes, I mean, who likes to open kitchen cabinets and see crumbs, okay? If I see any more frozen peas in a freezer that I open when they're go opening the appliances, like gross, it's just gross. Well, and I it's, also think too- And oh, by the way, what does it do? It gives my my, my cleaning lady more business because all I'm doing is going here, call my cleaning lady. Right, but you know, I think too, it's, it's you know, this is a happy day for them. Don't oh, make like it miserable. Not, right? You know, totally. they don't want to have this like sour taste in their mouth. And then, you know, I've had sellers who were just total assholes and then their kids ended up on the same like baseball team. And you're like, OK, well, now you have to confront this person because you are right, part of the community mingled with them somewhere. Staying around. That's you right. You never know. When, you know, same thing with agents, too. I know we talk about this all the time is like, you know, having good relationships with agents, too. You never know when you're going to run into that person again. So just be a good person. A hundred percent. A hundred percent. I'll tell you something I want to see when I walk through a walkthrough with a buyer. I want to see a note from the seller mm -hmm. to the buyers wishing them well in the house maybe sharing, you know, a story about, you know, we raised our children here, we've lived here for 20 years, it's just been such happy memories in our home and we wish you to make the same happy memories and leave that with a bottle of wine mm -hmm. or a bottle of champagne, probably one that's been in your refrigerator for like 20 years <laughs> that you never drank, <laughs> leave it for them, right? You're still not going to drink it, but it's just such a nice gesture. And it just sets the tone. It also sets the tone for the nice walkthrough, right? Yeah. It, yeah. If, if, if a buyer walks in and a seller leaves a nice note like that and a bottle of wine, wouldn't you wouldn't you agree that the buyer might be a little less likely to pick on a little yes. something that they a find? hundred percent. I, I actually just had a closing a couple of days ago and um you know, we had a few hiccups along the way, um, just between financing and, you know, the seller just really didn't want to do anything. He paid very little for the house, like I think 70000 and we were paying like three twenty seven. So I'm like, you're making a lot of money on this house. And he just would not budge on anything. And we went to the walkthrough. Um, it was a flip. So obviously it was a vacant house, but he left an orchid plant for them, a card and a gift card to ShopRite for $100. Oh so my like, gosh. To them, they were like, all right, that's like the olive branch. And the funny part is, is that the seller lives, it's on a private road. The seller lives the street, the house at the top of the hill. So I, I thought that was nice, but it did it allowed them to kind of feel like, all right, they're, they're trying, you know, they don't, they're not total assholes. They're just, you know, that's business right. is business, you know? Goodwill. Goodwill goes such a long way, not only at the walkthrough, but throughout the entire transaction. A little bit of goodwill throughout will actually create that scenario where you're saying people, it doesn't create mistrust, right? When there's mistrust, that's when people go nuts, right? It's mm -hmm. like, well, I can't trust this person. What else are they hiding? What are they doing? Da, 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 da. Right. And when you don't want that and you got all the way to the closing day, the last thing you want to do is leave the house so that the people don't trust you and, and it doesn't go well, doesn't sit right. Right. And when you get to the closing and you realize you only had one garage remote, not both garage remotes. Right. Well, guess what? If you were a jerk and you left the house a mess, they're going to want to bust your chops over that garage remote. 
But mm-hmm. if you're not, you left them a bottle of wine and you clean the house for them and it looks good, well, then guess what? They're probably going to say, ah, don't worry about it. It's all good. Uh, no we'll problem. go on Amazon and buy a new one. Don't worry. Yeah. <laughs> and let me tell you, and, and as an agent, I'll tell you, I'll tell you something, um, Justin, sometimes we do things that we don't necessarily have to do, but it's a gesture. Um, mm-hmm. I had a listing recently, um, the buyer agent was, you know, f- from the community, right? Um, I, I, I know him, um, haven't done a lot of deals with him, but respect him. And at the walkthrough, there were two, um, the Yale electric locks, you know what I'm talking about? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? The push button, you know, the code yeah. locks. Yeah. Well, they do come with keys, right? There's also a key associated with the keypad lock. Um, my seller didn't have them, right? And, you know, shame on me, right? I didn't ask them for them. I was used to using the lock. Um, the buyer wanted keys to those locks in addition to the thing, Right. And my seller had not one key to the house. And, and I didn't realize this. They had not They had already bought another house. They didn't have a key. And listen, could I have said, oh, they're going to change the locks anyways. What's the problem? Who cares? You know what? It was a big deal to the buyers. The buyers were giving the buyer agent a hard time. So he had called a locksmith. I said, you know what? Put the bill on my office desk. Drop the bill off. I will pay for it. And you know what? It was goodwill, you know, because I could have been a jerk, but that buyer agent did the right thing. And on my end, I felt that, you know what, maybe I fell down and I, I should have made sure my sellers had the keys. And at the end of the day, if they didn't have the keys, they were going to have to go get the keys anyways, too. Right. Yeah. So just, you know, like you just said, good karma, be a good person. It's no skin off your back and it just makes everyone feel good. And at the end of the day, that's what we want. We want good transactions and, you know, and as corny as it sounds, we're building communities. We really are. That's right. And I will say the one thing I hate walking to a walkthrough with is uh, sellers who have dogs clean up the yard, please. (laughs) I can't tell you how many times I've run into that where they just don't even care. They don't care. That's the poop conveys the house. Poop poop Yeah. Yeah, you have to put that in the. You have to put that in the contract. Yeah, right. Including poop. Pick up the landmines before we close. <laughs> that is gross. That is right. the, yeah, yeah. All right, sellers, make note. Pick up after your pets before you move out. All right, we're gonna wrap. You guys, this was so much fun. We'll do this again. And if anyone has anything you want us to talk about next Thursday, seven o'clock, seller series. We're here every Thursday night. We're talking about sellers. We're talking about, um, we've talked about staging and home inspections. And um, we're just trying to provide value and have a little fun and have a thirsty Thursday cocktail. Um, And maybe next week, Bruce will uh, not be playing softball and he'll come join us. And then we'll have the older cute version of Bruce and the young cute version. Hey, let's do it. All (laughs) the same time. Look at that. All right. This was fun. Yeah. Will you guys join again? This was awesome. Yeah. All right. Good um, times. And uh, yeah, maybe next time we can even talk about like a little bit more about the market. We have some great slides to talk about what's going on in the market. And I don't know about you guys, but, you know, the market's shifting, right? I mean, yeah. it's still sure. strong, but, you know, a lot of sellers do think, you know, what their neighbor got, you know, four months ago is what they're going to get. And not always the case, right? Not always right. Have to be very aware of price, presentation, and the market, right? Absolutely, hundred percent. All right, you guys. Absolutely. Thanks everyone for watching, and we will catch you next week. Thank you. Bye.